good evening, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the November 12th meeting of the City of Tampa Variance Review Board. My name is Gary Brown, and I'm the chairman this evening. From my left, the members of the board are... <clears throat> Michael Villa. Brett Feldman. <coughs> Lynn Hertak. Sam Walker. Also in attendance this evening are Kate <coughs> Wells, the Assistant City Attorney, right? Okay. Uh, Rabbi, or excuse me, Roberta Mead Curry uh, and Eric Cotton of Land Development Coordination, Brian Knox of Natural Resources, and no one from Transportation. Okay. I'll take just a few minutes to review tonight's procedures. Cases will be called in the order that they appear on the agenda. When your case number and the applicant's name are called, please stand in either aisle to the side of the room to acknowledge that you are here. Staff will then give a brief introduction to the board of each application. When you approach the podium, please speak into the microphone and state your name, address, and if you've been sworn in. The applicant and or their agent will have 10 minutes to give testimony, present witnesses, and documentation as a part of their presentation. This is your time to present all of your evidence. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support of or in opposition to the application will then have three minutes each. After that, the board may have an opportunity to ask questions regarding the application. Finally, the applicant will have an additional five minutes for rebuttal if needed. The time periods as stated will be kept by me, the chair. Any information such as pictures or plans that have not been previously submitted as a part of your petition and you intend to present at this hearing for consideration in support of your petition must be individually presented and accepted by the board. After the acceptance by the board, you must submit the item to staff for it to be entered and made a part of the permanent record. The board bases its decision on competent and substantial evidence which is presented this evening and which meets the criteria required by the city's code of ordinances. The variance granted by the board will be only for what is shown on the site plan and will be compliant with any terms and conditions stated in the approval by the board. You must have four votes for the variance to be approved. If an insufficient vote is obtained, the case will be automatically carried over for consideration at the board's next meeting. If approved, your variance will expire two years from today's date. All other city codes will need to be met. <clears throat> if your case is continued, it will be continued to either uh, December 10th or we booked up. Okay. Um, oh, excuse me. Well, I'll come back to it. Uh, if your case is continued, it will be continued to either the December 10th or January 14th public hearing dates. <clears throat> I do want to point out that we have five board members here tonight, um, and it, it only takes three votes to deny an, an application, according to our bylaws. So you need four votes to get approved. You only need three votes to be denied. <clears throat> If you wish to appeal the Variance Review Board's decision to City Council, you must file a petition for review of the Board decision within 10 business days of that decision. If your variance is granted, you will not be able to pull any permits until after the 10-day appeal period has passed. Your cooperation will help ensure that this meeting runs smoothly and will be greatly appreciated. Before we begin the first case, is there any business regarding the agenda that staff would like to address? Yes, good evening. Uh, Roberta Mead Curry, Planning, Design, and Development Coordination. We do have a request of the board to amend the agenda for this evening. Case number VRB 19-112 was not scheduled for hearing today, but did uh, possibly affect notice. So we're asking that that case be added to the agenda, but continue to the December hearing. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to uh, continue that case to the <coughs> December 10th meeting? All right. Uh, is there a second for that? I'll second. All right. We have a motion for approval and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good dinner. We'll see you next month. <laughs> 
<clears throat> All right, with no further business to discuss, is our motion to approve last month's minutes without objection? All right, we have a motion. All in favor, say, say aye. 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 Okay, minutes are approved. All right, I will now ask, um, excuse me, I will now ask Ms. Wells um, to address the board regarding any ex parte communications. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'd like to ask the members of the board if they've had any ex parte communications regarding any matters coming before the board this evening. If you've had any verbal communications, please disclose the sum and substance of the communications, when and where the communications occurred, and with whom it occurred. If you've had any, if you've received any written communications, please disclose the nature of the communications and file a copy of those communications in the record. So no ex parte communications. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, at this time, all persons who will be presenting evidence or testimony to the board shall rise and be sworn in. If you're going to speak tonight, please stand up. <laughs> All right, we'll call the first case, uh, BRB 19-22. All Good evening, Roberta Mead Curry, Planning, Design, and Development Coordination. I will be filling in as your new VRB administrator. Welcome. Again, case number VRB 1922. The address of the property is 3004 West Bay Vista Avenue. The property is requesting to reduce the rear yard setback from 20 feet to one foot and reduce the side yard, east side yard setback from seven feet to 1.25 feet to vest an existing garage. Applicant is also seeking to add on to the existing one car garage structure and building a new open carport along the east property. The property is zoned RS50. <coughs> the house was purchased in 2015. The existing family residence was built in 1926. The applicant has also submitted to the city a release of easement under ROE 1912. I have some information regarding the property. Staff has found um, the request inconsistent. <coughs> this is the aerial of the area in question. The outline in red is the property. The surrounding area is zoned RS50. And there's a PD next door. The site plan is here. Is that right side up? <laughs> Bear with me. First time. Okay. If I need to enlarge that, let me know. But this is the site plan, the front of the the front of the street and the side yard. The side yard in question is this piece here with the existing garage in the back, the addition and a carport coming out to the front. Could you tighten that just a little bit? It's a little fuzzy. Hi, you want me to blow it up a little bit more? Yeah, please. Thank you. No, that was fine. Good. Just okay. trying to read the word. This is the property looking in the front. Looking west, looking east, this is looking along the west property line, and looking along the east property line with the existing structure in the back. I'm here if you have any other questions. Any questions for staff? 
All right, don't see any. All right, will the applicant or their agent please come forward and state your name, address, and if you've been sworn in. You will have 10 minutes for your presentation. Good evening. My name is Alan Dobbs with Florida Design Studio. I have been sworn. My address is 5502 North Cherokee Avenue. Rebecca or, or Becky is my client. She's here tonight. Um, she uh, first contacted me about wanting to replace her garage because the garage is only 11.4 by 15.4, which is really not enough room to put a car in, even a even a modest uh, compact car. So. Um, so we, so I told her, well, the only way to do that is it won't fit to do another garage because of where the existing house is. And also, um, you know, if you want to stay in the same footprint, you're going to have to get a variance for that. So we proceeded to, uh, work out a design and then apply for a variance. And then with that, then we realized we needed to get a release of easement. So that kind of delayed the project for a while. Um, nobody had a problem with it except Tico, and we went around and around with Tico on it. Um, Tico has replaced multiple poles on that block, um, but even with that, they said they would not release the easement. So, um, so we were kind of stuck at that point. So, uh, I told my client really the only option is to repair the building, and so, but with that, we can't, still can't fit a car in it. So I said, well, you know, maybe one option is we just add to the front of it. So. Um, so we added to the to the front of it. Now I have some detailed drawings that I can show you, but also she, she wanted to be able to get from the garage to the house without you know if it's raining like it was tonight when everybody was coming here. Um, so, but because of the proximity of the accessory structure to the house, um, we we didn't meet the eve to eve separation, and and we couldn't do a typical connector that's allowed where it has to be open on both sides and can't be wider than like seven feet. So, uh, but also the, the back of the house faces south. So, um, so we discussed that a, a, a rear porch as that would also serve as a connector would be a really uh, a good feature to have in the back considering there's very little shade in the back. So, so those were the two main things is to accommodate one car, possibly two, and then also to add a, um, a covered connector or, or rear porch. Um, I have some, um, pictures that I'll show. Um, this shows the house. I guess this microphone works so everybody can hear me okay. So this shows the existing house and the existing garage. And this telephone pole is very new, but um, regardless, uh, our only option was to, to come forward. Um, one of the interesting things about looking at the development patterns when we were going through with Tico was this is the property here this is a Sanborn map from 1951. Um, there's no platted alley on this. There, there is on this block, but not on this block. So it's kind of um, inconsistent. But also, you can see there's multiple accessory buildings. I have a closer view. So there's multiple accessory buildings on this block that are still existing in there within uh, that that um, that easement, which is basically an abandoned alley. When my client purchased the property in, in 2015, she did do a modest addition. This actually addresses one of the hardship criteria that's not a um, self-imposed uh, hardship. Uh, this is the um, survey when she bought the house, you, you know, there, there, and then she did an addition right here, but nothing in this area. This is the existing garage, and then. This is actually one of the construction drawings from that. So um, you can see that there was an addition right here. Here, I can zoom in some more. Um, so there's an addition here. It has a pair of French doors. Um, but again, nothing that she did with this addition uh, is in any way creating a hardship with that existing garage. I bought the new survey, but I think that's in the in the record. Um, the, the timeline of events, you can see this was continued since February. Obviously, that release of easement took a while, and then also um, the the wording on the um, on the variance. Um, I had sent an email to staff, and they said it was fine. And then it wasn't fine because I got a call of the 
on August 13th saying it's a missed notice. So the deadline had already passed for the next hearing. So that's why we're at this one. So um, anyway, so just to show some more detail on exactly what we're doing, this is what Roberta had shown earlier. That green line is, is, is where the uh, original uh, property line was, which is where the easement is right now. So you can see that this is the existing garage, which is, we aren't gonna do anything to it except add on to it. Um, so, and then uh, there's an existing opening here. So, so now it will be long enough for a car. It'll still be fairly narrow, but at least it'll be long enough to fit a car in. And then this is where the porch is. So we're bumping the porch out just enough to line up, line up with this part that is gonna bump out so that we can have a continuous wall along here because this house has a masonry parapet wall and the garage does as well. And you'll see that in the elevations. Um, and then the other part of this is a carport. So we just took the, the line of this structure right here and just extended it forward. Um, the, the, uh, you know, the building code should not be a problem because this is gonna be all masonry construction that we're doing. So, um, so it won't be, because um, you aren't allowed to have combustible materials that close to the property line. And This shows a little bit more detail. Again, I think this is in your package. It shows the, uh, this is all gonna be masonry here. And then you see the porch and then the carport right here. These, the, part of the carport too, um, and I know it's part, not part of the hardship criteria, but it, it does provide a transition between the garage and the house, and it's also architecturally a help sort of transition. So here you, you see the, the garage, and this is actually the opening for the carport right here. So you see the garage door beyond. Um, and then this is a section through the rear porch. Again, you can see beyond this is part of the addition, and then this is gonna be open um, to the carport beyond. Um, this shows it on the side, existing garage, and then this is uh, where we're adding on to the garage, and then the carport from there on, and it's, and it's open here. Um, a lot of these houses had uh, this uh, vintage in the mid-20s, did have port cachers or carports, so it is sort of a, a typical development pattern. Um, this is the rear porch. Again, this just has uh, wood columns and a beam, and then uh, a low slope roof, and then this is all uh, existing. One of the um, things uh, that I did amend was this is the application. This was a comment that I got from Roberta last week that uh, on the original application, we needed to uh, revise this text to, uh, to match what was on the public notice. So that's been done. This document is in Oscilla, so it's in the public record now. Um, the next thing is the, um, the hardship. Um, just kind of summarizing the hardship. Uh, the first one is that these hardships or practical difficulties are unique and singular with respect to the property or with respect to the structure or building thereon and are not those suffered in common with other property structures and buildings similarly located. Most, ha most uh, well, I'll read my response. Um, due to the size of the lot, in location of the undersized existing garage structure built approximately 1926, there is no way to replace or modify the existing garage without a variance. In addition, there's no way to provide covered access like a breezeway from the garage to the house that, and, and meet the requirements of chapter 27 for a covered connector. The new covered connector will double as a new rear porch and provide desperately needed shade on the south side of the existing residence. Um, the next hardship relates to the practical difficulty is not the result of the applicant. Uh, this property was purchased in 2015. My client did do an addition, but beyond that, uh, nothing that she has done has, uh, has any bearing on, on this uh, petition. The third hardship is that the, this variance, if granted, will not substantially interfere or injure the health, safety, welfare, or others whose property would be affected by the allowance of the variance. It only, it's not affecting the rear because the rear is remaining exactly as it is and it's not really affecting the side because we're just extending it but it's mostly open where we're adding on to it. 
Um, and then the, um, the next one is the variance is in harmony with and serve the general intent and purpose of this chapter and the adopted Tampa comprehensive plan. Most properties have the ability to have enclosed or covered parking and reasonable private outdoor living areas like a rear porch to support single family use. That is not the case for this property because of the existing site constraints. The last, can you, can you okay, wrap up? I just, yeah, this is just the last up? one and I'm done. Yeah. Um, allowing the variance will result in substantial justice being done. Uh, the, my response, this is revised from what y'all have because uh, the last sentence I, I changed um, and I'll go ahead and read that response. This variance will allow the existing dilapidated and undersized attached garage to be modified to accommodate a modest size garage for one vehicle. Additionally, the open carport will provide additional covered parking and provide a transition between the garage and the main house. So this has not been uploaded to Isilla, but I can submit this for public record. And and, la and so uh, my client is here if, uh, if you'll have any questions of her. Uh, no, not at this time. Okay. You'll, we'll need to wrap up and we can come back to you with questions. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this application, either for or against? Okay, seeing none. Uh, does anybody have questions for the applicant and or staff? <coughs> Mr. Villa? I have a, a quick question. So <clears throat> I see that the existing garage has a uh, depth dimension of 15 feet, four inches or so. Yes. So, in my mind, I don't see a lot of cars fitting in there. So there, is it really unusable? Do they have a car in the garage now? It's just tight. Uh, no, they they really don't. Yeah. Because unless you get a um, like a smart car or a very small subcompact yeah. car, um, I will show you the the floor plan again that shows you, you know, where we're with this addition. Then you know we're adding basically six feet. To the building so then it will accommodate a, a vehicle it could be tied on the sides but at, at least you can accommodate the vehicle and she can park a little bit more to one side to get out of the driver's side yeah yeah that's what i thought and also it looks like you're doing a good job of preserving the look of the house on this uh on this addition on the front of the garage. yeah i do a lot of work in the historic districts in camp and that's a very important element of this i know it's not for the board's consideration but it is important <laughs> for me and my client yeah all right very good thank you questions um, yeah so your application um, also requests um, an allowance for an encroachment is that an encroachment into the Tico easement that is yeah I had that for um, for gutters I think there is an existing gutter there now so but to replace it or whatever I just it, you know it's one of those things that we figured we better put in um, so, so that we can not have a problem later. Um, so, um, but, um, okay. yeah. Questions? Uh, yes. Um, you mentioned when you showed the picture of the older, uh, of uh, the different plots for the, the houses and the garages, you noted you noted that there were a lot of other older garages. Have any of those been retrofit? To your knowledge? Um, do, you, do you know? Um, well, you can just tell by the scale of, of looking mm -hmm. at this that um, I don't know, let me get this to the point with. Um, you know, these are all approximately the same size. This is not like this now. This this property is part of that PD mm -hmm. that Roberta showed, and they had to do that because there's a lot of these, a lot of uh, things in those two properties that are non-compliant, um, and that's how they address that. But you can see all these accessory structures. These might have been removed um, at one time, but like this one, you know, they have a port cashier, so they have covered parking. So, and, and a lot of those houses have been uh, removed, you know, uh, demolished, and then uh, rebuilt. You know, with the more modern structure. Oh, yeah, come on up. You need to come up and uh, so tell us your name, yourself. address, and if you've been sworn in. Rebecca Kajaski, 3004 West Bay Vista. And yes, you've been sworn in. Yes. Thank you. So the structure to the west of me actually is a little newer, and it's a larger garage, and it actually encroaches on my property line. 
which I did not know when I bought the property because it didn't show up on the survey. Um, and down the street, there are, as Ellen said, newer structures that were torn down and rebuilt probably in the last 10 years that all have um, back structures, garages, et cetera. Does anybody else have any questions? Mr. Dobbs, I've got a question, or sure. a couple of questions. Um, again, we, we have the task of listening to the, to the hardships and what makes this property unique and singular and different than other properties or similar properties. And yes, you're right, a lot of them do appear to have accessory structures, uh, but how many of those accessory structures now are enjoined to the primary structure in the neighborhood, like you're asking tonight. How many of them are? How many of the accessory structures are now, have been connected to the primary structure and therefore they're all primary structure? On both sides of me. On both sides of you. Mm -hmm. Do you have, do you have any photos or anything that you can show us? And I was curious about the neighbor, if I have my north, south, east, to the west. Mm -hmm. That's the new home or not the new home? There's a new home to the east to of the me going east. towards Bayshore. Okay. And have they you have a connection to their garage. Did you have a conversation with the neighbor to the west? Because that's, well, excuse me. No, you're, you're, you're on the east. You're right. So the new home to the east, you're right. saying encroaches on your property? No, it's the other side oh, that encroaches on okay. the property. Right. Sorry. But they also, on the east side, going toward, towards mm. Bayshore, have a connection to their garage where they have an overhang or a... Uh, a roof connecting. I, I would like to point out one additional thing in response to your question. Um, if we look at this um, here. So if we did not do this porch, we just did the addition. Um, originally we were like five feet, and the, which is the minimum. We have no overhang, we were five feet. We would have been fine, but, but then she couldn't have had a porch or anything. And there's, that's part of the hardships because everybody else can certainly build porches on the back of their house. and. She really can't, so it just sort of made sense that, you know, it sort of kills two birds with one stone. We're providing a covered connection to the house, but also providing a porch. And, and you're right, once you, once you connect them, then the garage becomes part of the primary uh, structure, which uh, is why we're Roberta, here today. The follow-up question, Roberta, would be that those, the codes do allow a connection, a way to connect. Can you tell us what that is? Mm -hmm. Yes, Roberta uh, Mead Curry, uh, Planning, Design, and Development Coordination. Um, there is an allowance to require a, a breezeway. That would be another option to connect. There is some criteria that it can never be enclosed, has to be open on both ends. Um, so there is an option there, and they almost kind of address it in that fashion, almost like a breezeway. It almost has it open on two sides. So that is yes. available. I do have one more thing to add to the record. If you would like me to do that now, I can. Uh, sure, go ahead. Okay. In, in regards to your question uh, and the release of easement, there is a release of easement petition, and it has to do with um, the area in the back. If I can zoom this up again. And again, the alley, the previous alley that is now um, part of the property, and it has to do with the easement that's back here where the existing garage is. So we had suggested that maybe there would be a condition placed on uh, how you decide tonight if their approval is contingent on the approval of that release of easement. Okay. Um, I'd like to address that. Um, well, hang on for a second. Okay. Let me finish my question. Okay. Sure. So, okay, sorry. Okay, so, and Roberta, you may have to. I mean, this is getting a little technical, but the definition of a breezeway is, besides being open on, both sides. Is there a size or width uh, maximum? Uh, the size or width is not codified, but we have a policy in the office that it should be seven and a half feet wide, minimum. Okay. Okay. And if in this case, in this design, if that breezeway <coughs> was in front of the garage addition and connected to the proposed porch addition would that meet would that meet the code as long as they maintain the five foot separation or because it might be architecturally attached that way it wouldn't meet it 
Okay, tell me again how you're looking at it because I'm not seeing that. Well, they're, they're asking for this variance which causes the accessory to become primary because of the desire to have the rear porch roof. The rear porch roof, the proposed rear porch roof could be built five feet away from all of this and still maintain separation. But then they could still connect to that, correct, with a breezeway, which, which, I, would, seem, which would seem to be a little uh, difficult in terms of how that would look. And I understand and appreciate the architectural solution here. Um, I, I respectfully disagree with you, okay. and I can demonstrate why. Um, so, so this is where you enter the house on the rear. This is all a master uh, bathroom here, master bedroom. So there's no option to enter the house here. And even if you could enter the house over here, you couldn't do a breezeway because it's, it's encroaching into the driveway here. Likewise, um, you know, you could do a breezeway that like comes across here and then connects to the house like this like this, and that could be remain as uh, five feet. But that's not a very good design. That's not a very functional design. And by the time you do this, what's the difference between having a roof here and go ahead and having this whole area roofed here? So that was, that was one of the design challenges that I had and really struggled with, was I could not figure out how to get a breezeway that could be open on both sides that it, it allow you to get from the garage to this door. Well, you, you just showed us how, <laughs> but the other yeah, issue, yeah. the other issue that I'm, that I'm questioning is also the need for the extended carport, because if you're fixing the garage design by adding to the front and you're fixing the connection of that covered um, access to a new covered porch, what's the need for the additional carport? And again, we're looking at the total size of the lot, what makes this different and unique. There are lots of lots around the neighborhood that are 50 by 100 or 105 that have a similar setup. So um, what makes this one different? Well, I, haven't, I, okay. I haven't personally yet okay. heard what well, makes it ma different. What makes this one different is if any developer was gonna buy this house, they would simply tear the house down. Um, you know, we're trying to preserve the existing um, some of this existing architecture of Tampa with this house being a, it'd be a contributing structure if it was in the uh, historic district. Any other house, you can easily have two cars under cover. And we thought that by having an open carport uh, as an extension of this garage would not interfere with the neighbor any more than the existing garage. Yeah, it's certainly longer, but it's open. And it's not, it's not high, it's just a single, a single story. And, and that's how we're unique and singular because every other property, they could easily do um, a two-car garage. They would just tear the house down and rebuild it. We're trying to preserve this existing structure and work within the existing conditions, which is really what is creating the hardship for us. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? I'm seeing none. You have five minutes for a rebuttal, Mr. Dobbs. Um, I think I'm okay. Do you have anything that you'd like to add? Okay. You, you oh, no, no, I'm, I'm good, yes. You're good? Mm -hmm. Okay, without objection, I'll, uh, well, are you okay with the condition that if we do approve tonight regarding the easement um, approval, or? Oh, yeah, I wanted to address that, yeah. The, the, uh, that was the issue that we had was we applied for the release of easement. It could not be granted because TICO would, refu they refused to release the easement. All the city of Tampa departments really, would release it no problem because the city doesn't have any utilities or anything back there. It was only TECO. And because of TECO, that's why we said, well, the existing structure just has to remain. Uh, our only option is to add to one side of it. So the existing, even though, and this is the logic that didn't make any sense and what was so frustrating for my client, is even if we built the building back in the exact footprint, height, and everything, um, they still said no, they wouldn't do it. So, so the only option is to leave that portion of the building there and simply you know, repair it. 
uh, the best we can so that it remains. So, so yeah, we are not doing any work in the easement other than repair and replace. I know there was a question about the gutters. You know, I, I understand the question about that, but we just kind of put that in as a, just so that the gutters would not be a problem because, you know, the city stormwater has a problem, you know, with water draining, you know, that close to the property. So by having the gutter and the downspout, it will direct the water to the back of the property where it won't go on the neighbor's property. Okay. Thank you. Got it. All right, without objection, I'm going to move to close the public hearing. Uh, board um, open for a motion and or discussion. All right, so that condition issue that you brought up is not an issue then, as far as Apparently not. Concerned. All right, that's, that's what I thought. Council, you want to advise us? Well, I think we need to hear from staff on whether or not that's an issue. You know, we've heard from the applicant saying it's not an issue. I don't know if when the release of easement was applied for, if the design was different and if they were proposing additional work within the easement area, which I'm not even sure where it is because the site plan that I have show. and right. evidently there's a new survey, but I don't know that we saw the survey. The fact that it's been downloaded to Excel, it doesn't mean it's part of the record of this hearing. Well, right. I'm just curious, is, does that, whatever happens with that, would that supersede whatever happens here? Like if we approve it and Tico says no, then it's not uh, Close the public hearing, Mr. Dodds. Oh, okay. is my, I think my recommendation would be that if, the, if um, the board is inclined to approve the variance because you feel that the applicant has met the hardship criteria, mm -hmm. that you include uh, the release of easement as a condition of approval if staff determines that the release is necessary. That will allow staff additional time to address the easement and possibly address it with TICO, um, but to determine if, if it's necessary, because I don't know if staff is prepared to address that this evening. But I'm unclear as to the connection between the, the easement and the proposed work, but I don't know if the design has changed since TICO looked at this. Why would this be much different than the fact that an applicant still has to meet all building code? criteria is we don't motion or, or make decisions on that. We you know, it's still subject to other reviews. And they certainly are, but I, I think an easement and a release of an easement is, is separate and distinct from having to comply with other permitting requirements. Yeah. So do we have a motion to open the public hearing back up? <clears throat> so moved. Okay. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Mr. Dobbs, we're going to try again. Okay. Apparently, uh, we, we need to, if we're going to approve this, we have to condition okay. it on well, the release okay. from TICO. First off, there was some, there was some uh, misinformation about the survey, um, Council. Uh, with all due respect, th there, the survey uh, that I is, is on file in Oscilla. It, it was part of. Uh, Do you have a copy of it tonight? Well, yeah, it was, it was part of the, the staff report. It's right here. Um, Mr. Dobbs, if I may, just the fact that it's in Excel doesn't make it a part of the record of this hearing, and yeah, I'm only looking oh, okay. at the staff right. report that was provided to me, and it wasn't in there. So okay. it's great that you have it, but you might okay. want to make sure it's part of tonight's well, record. Okay. Yeah, if you can give it, if you can turn a copy in tonight, that would be all, okay. all that we need, I believe. Okay. So, does this survey show the easement? Yes, it does. It, it's right here. See that it says right here. Oh, let me, Can let you me blow that up a little bit? Yeah. It shows a, a platted line in, a, in an that, alley. That's the easement. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, and I did print an extra copy of that for uh, for the record. So I will I will submit that to the staff. Sorry. I'm, okay. <coughs> right here. Can we rely on a document that isn't certified that it's an easement? It's, it's not even called out as an easement. I was expecting that that exhibit would have been amended to show where the easement area right. is. Okay. Um, the purpose of this is for an overhead power line? Is that why the easement exists? Y yes. Even though the, the overhead power line is more than 35 feet above the ground. Okay. And, yeah, we went through all this with Tico. <laughs> but... Uh, but yeah, so Tico would not release the easement. So this design, the, the way it's done, uh, is designed so that 
we are not doing anything within the easement. That's why we're leaving the existing structure as it is. So the east, so so yeah, we did. We applied for the lease the easement, but because Tico wouldn't grant it, it was it was denied. So that's why we have the. Um, that's why we're doing it this way with the leaving the existing building. Does that answer our question? If staff could address that, it, it was a staff request for a condition of approval. So, again, Roberta Curry, um, Planning, Design, and Development Coordination. I think the best staff member to be present to address that is uh, someone from right away. And um, unless, I don't know if there's someone else that <clears throat> might be able to address that here tonight. <coughs> Yep. I mean, if we have a drawing, it's a survey, we have the boundaries of what is testified to be the easement on that survey, can we not rely upon that? I mean, I, I thought we had relied upon in the past people taking We've a survey a lot less. And, <laughs> and drawing things on there to say right. this is the boundary, I'm testifying that this is the boundary. Can we not rely upon testimony that's been provided before us that the dotted line of the original plat line is the is the easement is that not something we can do that's what mr. Dobbs is testifying to and I'm assuming that he has seen the document creating the easement so he can confirm that that is the easement area typically on a survey the surveyor will identify the easement where it was recorded yeah. and where it's located Right. Um, but uh, if that is Mr. Dobbs' testimony and he's under oath, then you can accept it for that purpose. Okay, that's what I thought. All right, thank you. I think we're done. <laughs> Any other questions before I close the public hearing? Again? So, Mr. Dobbs, you're okay if we if we if we do approve it tonight that we make it conditional on the release from Tico. Um, I don't think that will work because if it's conditioned on a release of easement, then we can't. We can't do the project, um, and that was why we were leaving the existing structure. Um, you know, I, I would, um, yeah, I mean that, yeah, because if, if it's contingent on the release of easement, like I said, I'm testifying here tonight. It was denied because Tico would not approve it. So that's why this design evolved the way it did, so that we wouldn't, we're not doing work within the easement other than repair, which is allowed within the easement. You're just not allowed to uh, modify or improve anything within the easement, but you're allowed to repair it and, and maintain it. So it sounds like the easement's not an issue for us at all, then. No, it's, it's not. <coughs> what, what, if, what if we uh, conditioned it upon release or uh, otherwise non-impact? I don't think that's the right language, but that the, uh, that the work would not change place within the easement. I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, I, my recommendation was if deemed necessary by staff that they obtain a release of easement and that way, um, you know, ultimately the release of easement is processed by the city, not TECO, although TECO may need to consent to it, but this that would allow this to move forward this evening um, and allow staff to address right. the easement to the extent that it remains applicable. Could the wording be if the staff requests a release of easement? Because then that would allow them to not request it. You know, because if, if, it, if this is contingent on the release of easement, I've already said we that's already been denied. And my but, recommendation okay. was contingent if deemed necessary by oh, staff. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, I misheard it. Sorry. Okay. All right. I think we're good now. All right. Without objection, I'll move to close the public uh, hearing. Staff, what's your pleasure? Staff, board, excuse me. All right, well, I'll make a, a comment and then uh, we'll see where that goes. But I mean, it seems to me it's perfectly reasonable to assume that this garage needs to be modified uh, in order to function as a, as a practical uh, uh, part of the property. Uh, modern vehicles will not fit in the garage and, uh, <clears throat> and you know that's not acceptable and I realized the discussion concerning the, the, 
Reese Way and the porch and everything was concerning whether or not this is going to create that as a as part of the permanent structure versus uh, <coughs> versus the, uh, the the separate structure as the garage. But I mean, I think it's been presented that it, you know it's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, you know, this house and garage <coughs> were built in 1926. They're going to conform this new addition to the garage, you know, keeping with the aesthetics of, of uh, properties from that era, which I think uh, is a good thing because we, we all see that these kind of houses get torn down. So I think they're doing a great job <coughs> modifying this house to make it more functional. So I would be in support. Any other comments? I'll just echo that um, I, I think that uh, the existing structures, the practical difficulties um, uh, associated with the 1926 home, um, the Tico easement, um, and the size of this lot suggests that the uh, design is reasonable um, and uh, that a variance is, would be appropriate under the circumstances. Um, you had talked about the idea that once this, the garage was attached to the structure, <coughs> that it would all be considered one structure? Yeah, it's prime, it, that's why they're here tonight, because they're yeah. reducing the primary structure setbacks to make this design work. So then could they take that garage and add on to it as a, you know, add another bedroom because it's now part of the primary structure? Sure. It doesn't have to be a garage. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a garage once it's part of, oh, once it's well, under the, the roof. The, this. Yes. Oh, but, but they'd also have two um, open areas. Open okay. areas, so right. those would be. Right. But you could. Class. Right. Yeah, but you don't have to keep it a garage, is my point. Um, once you're under one roof, and I just, I don't see how it's unique and singular with the neighborhood with these circa 1926 homes. I mean, extending the garage, I think is very reasonable, but adding on a carport isn't necessarily necessary. Um, if you're extending the garage, you are then making it usable. That's, to me, that would be enough. I would be happy to do that. I think the adding of the carport just doesn't seem as necessary and to be as, it goes beyond the practical difficulty. Ms. Walker, do you have anything? Um, well, I guess I will echo um, Mr. Bia and Mr. Feldman's position that um, I think that uh, there's been hardship um, shown here. And, and more particularly, I think that um, you know, the applicant has demonstrated that this won't interfere um, or injure the health, safety, and welfare. I mean, we focused a lot on the, um, the hardship and practical difficulties, but you know, there are four other criteria that we're to look at. And uh, taken as a whole, you know, I think that the applicant has demonstrated that they've complied here. <clears throat> All right, for me, it's um, the only difficulty I, that I have with this uh, proposal is, um, and, and certainly in light of the testimony regarding the easement, um, it just seems like the reasonable thing to have done would have been to have torn down the existing garage and moved it back. So you solve the easement problem by doing that. Um, and you could have almost the exact same design, um, but that's, that wasn't presented. Um, so I don't know if the Tico easement becomes a hindrance for them or not, and that's really not our purview tonight. Um, uh, the, the testimony that homes of this age have portico shares, that's correct. Typically the portico shares are not shoved all the way back up against another accessory structure. So that's you know, the point that I was trying to make is that they could probably get most of what they were trying to do here by not even doing the extended carport. I understand in today's lifestyle, people want, want the ability to have two cars and or a car and storage. And most likely something like that becomes storage as opposed to say living space. Um, you know, is, it, uh, in, is it consistent with the comprehensive plan? Yeah, it probably is. Um, so I'm kind of in the middle on this one. Um, I didn't really hear any testimony about the lot being other issues with the lot that caused this solution other than I want to have a connection 
uh, protection, et cetera. Well, I can guarantee you almost every owner of a, of a detached carport in this kind of a neighborhood would love to have that connection and not be here tonight. Uh, and there's a reason why this, the code is written the way it is. Um, it, this is. This is what I call creep. It's taking a, an older primary structure, preserving it, and nobody is proposing tonight that it be torn down, but resolving a, a desire and, in essence, <laughs> causing the primary structure to become much greater and larger in its footprint, which, down the road, the uses that are proposed tonight may not be the uses later on. Um, but um, so, you know, is it is it egregious? Probably not. Um, we didn't hear from the next door neighbor or neighbors. Um, you know, so I, you know, architecturally, I think they've done a great job. I think it I think it looks good. Okay, but my my big concern would be, does it meet the criteria uh, for a primary structure? And that's what this is all becoming. It's all becoming a primary structure. Is there a motion? Right. I can make a motion, but I want to clarify exactly what are we conditioning and how are we going to do that again? It's a great question. So if the motion is to approve the variance as requested in the application, that it be subject to a release of easement if determined to be necessary by staff. All right. Let's see if I can squeeze a lot of this stuff in here. All right, I'd like to uh, move the variance request for BRB case 19 22 for property located at 3004 West Bay Vista Avenue in Tampa, presented at the public hearing for, uh, <clears throat> for relief from section 27 156 in order to reduce the rear yard setback from 20 feet to one foot and to reduce the east side yard setback from seven feet to one and uh, a quarter feet uh, <clears throat> under the, uh, <clears throat> with the following conditions. And that is that uh, <clears throat> on the opinion of, of staff, uh, you know, is there a release of, eas uh, of easement granted by TCO and if that's deemed necessary by staff. <clears throat> and that said, variance as conditioned be granted based upon the applicant presenting competent and substantial evidence in the record. And at this public hearing of an unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty when considering the five hardship criteria set forth in section 27-80 of the Tampa City Code. Specifically in this case, uh, I think the alleged hardships and practical difficulties uh, are unique and singular in that this is uh, <clears throat> a property bought uh, well after it was built in 1926. Uh, the structure of, of the garage is, uh, is basically outdated. It uh, won't accommodate modern vehicles, and thus uh, uh, that would be a, certainly a practical difficulty. Uh, so it doesn't result from the actions of the applicant. Uh, there is a small lot here. We do have a TECO easement that comes into play on the rear. So I think that uh, the solution that's come up with, uh, <clears throat> they have come up with, uh, is also in keeping harmony with the adjacent neighborhood structures, the neighborhood, and uh, and that sort of thing. I would ask one point of clarification on that. I think you did a great job, by the way. <laughs> um, and that is, uh, are we indicating at all that the portions on the site plan depicted as open and unclosed remain so? We can do that. Would you like to amend so your I'm, motion accordingly? So I would like to amend the motion in the under conditions. So in addition to uh, the release of uh, the easement, if deemed necessary by staff, also that uh, according to the site plan that the open areas uh, remain open and not be enclosed. And I will second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Villa for approval and a second by Mr. Feldman. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. You've been approved four to one. Next case 
is BRB. 19-92. Again, Roberta Curry, Planning, Design, and Development Coordination. BRB case number 19-92. The address is 2608 West Morrison Avenue. This case has been continued from uh, last month's hearing. The code section in question is 27156. The applicant is seeking to reduce the west side yard setback from seven feet to zero feet. The next section of the code is 27-290 regarding the accessory structure setbacks to be reduced from three feet to zero feet and the building separation from five feet to one feet. The reason being to vest existing conditions. The property is zoned RS60 and was purchased in 2018. The existing single family residence was constructed in 1926. The property in question is outlined in red. Morrison Avenue is along here. Surrounding properties are RS60. And there is a PD here to the northeast. <laughs> Site plan submitted uh, to the record. And again, the area in question for the carport and the setbacks on the side is here. You can please silence your cell phones. <laughs> okay, let me go back and correct, uh, look at the record. Okay, give me a second, Peter. Um, the accessory structure is here. Property to the front, view of the front. Property along the west side. West side again with the structure in question here and the accessory structure back here. along the street, looking west. East side of the street. <coughs> I'll put a couple others here and then this. This is the overhang area in the carport, a little bit more closer up, and the accessory structure. I'll take under advisement um, the applicant's agent, and I will correct the record here later if he said it's so amended for a different request. So give me a moment to look at the file. You can have the applicant come up and address. <coughs> Peter Gottschalk. 4745 Patagonia Place, Land Lakes, Florida. I have been sworn. Good evening. And um, yes, I, are you seeing the amended documents that were uploaded to Excel? Well, I believe we are. Why don't you show us what was amended? What was amended was the uh, side yard, west side setback is not being requested from seven to zero, it's from seven to three feet. We took to heart some of the comments that were made during the last meeting. Um, the west side neighbors felt that the zero setback was 
sort of putting us right on top of them, and there were some drainage problems, which we knew about. <clears throat> also, the subject came up um, that perhaps it would be easier to vest the original carport roof and without the little lean-to, which you saw in the pictures that you were shown. Um, it, truly, it truly wasn't not a part of the original structure. So we're talking about this. We propose to remove this and only, and this, leave this roof, which was part of the original construction, untouched, but to move the column over to its edge. So, The, the accessory building is already three feet, which meets the code. So for, it, for the accessory structure, we're only asking for the zero setback in the rear, in existing condition. <clears throat> so this is what it would look like from the street. No lean to here at all. We're adding new gutters new downspouts, and a trench drain to carry any water from the roof out to the street. This is the view from the side. And this shows, this is where the existing columns are. Can you slide that up a little bit? No, no, the, the piece of paper. Oh, yeah. There you go, thank you. These are the existing columns. We need to move, them. we would like to move them to here. Now I do have a drawing which I just added. Do I understand that I have to show you that and see if it can be added to the record? Anything that will help your case, you should okay. show us and talk about. So this, again, in this orientation, a, and this car is the exact car that the owner has. Modern cars with their side view mirrors tend to be almost seven and a half feet wing to wing. At this point, the distance from the existing column to the stairway is not much more than eight feet. So squeezing it in there is a little hair raising. This is a picture of the condition we have now. So you drive in, can't really open this door and get out. Can you squeeze this thing back in here like this? Yeah. But then backing out of a space that's barely wide enough for your car, it's a little hair raising with the, with the wheel cranked. So <laughs> the owner, from the owner's point of view, this is, this is not a viable solution. It's too difficult. That's the hardship. So we are not adding anything in our proposal. We propose to remove a slight, somewhat unsightly afterthought lean-to and move the columns to make it possible to park more comfortably in the space. In addition, we will make certain, this is what's called an open structure much more susceptible to uplift from serious storms uh, than a closed structure. I, it's most likely that these footings for these columns would not meet today's uh, requirements for uplift. We'll make sure that the new ones do. So again, the amendment is from to change from seven feet to zero feet, change to seven feet to three feet, to remove the uh, lean-to shed. And uh, <coughs> of course, we can't apply for a permit at this point because there's a non-compliant existing condition. So the, if, if the variance is not approved, nothing will happen. That shed won't be removed and the, uh, the drainage conditions will exist. 
would be regrettable. I think what we're proposing to do improves the look of the property. It's a nice house um, for, for, for everyone concerned. Uh, with that, I'm happy to wait and listen to what other people have to say. All right, does that conclude your, your presentation? Do you have questions for me? Uh, we will later. Okay. I have to ask if there's anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this application, either for or against. Please come forward, state your name, address, and if you've been sworn. Oh, you want to come in now to clarify? Yeah, I want you to get us all on the same page, please. Yeah. Again, Roberta Curry, uh, Planning and Development. Um, the application has been amended, and because he was asking for a less severe request, he was allowed to present that information to you tonight, and we would, we're accepting it without being re-noticed. So the request is from seven feet down to three feet for the side yard setback. Okay, thank you. Stand corrected. All right. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to come forward? Please state your name, address, and if you've been sworn in. Uh, Darby Stedman, 2610 West Morrison Avenue, and I have been sworn in. Um, so we are the neighbors that are to the west. Um, and I guess one of the questions that we have, I don't really understand the process, and we don't have anyone guiding us, so I look to the board for a little direction. Um, when you get this variance, what happens next? Like, can they enclose this and make this a screened-in porch so they can have dogs running around and their children and all that kind of stuff? Um, why don't you ask all of your questions first? Okay. <laughs> then the next question would be, um, can then it be enclosed again to make to be a playroom? And then can they add a second story onto it? Like, I don't understand how this goes. Does it, is it in perpetuity where it, once it's on the property, it's always on the property as long as they're the owners? Or how does that work? I'm just not, I'm not familiar with this process. Okay. Um, we can answer every one of those questions, and we will. Uh, I want to just see if there's anybody else in the audience. In fairness, let them come up and speak, and they may have similar questions, and then we'll get them all answered at one time. Great. Thank you. So I'm John Stedman. Um, I've been sworn in 2610 West Morrison. I think okay. the one she didn't ask was the imperpetuity of the project. We understand the parking. We understand we have the same car they do to put in there. Um, let's say they move and new people want to come in and tear the house down. Where, where is the variance then? Can they build on the site where they tore the carport down or does it go back to the seven foot? Okay, and we'll, we'll That's answer. our big question. Okay, we'll, we'll be sure to answer that. Okay. Um, is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak? Yeah. Okay, no. seeing none. Um, now's the time for questions and answers. Um, staff, does somebody want to address those questions? I mean, we can, we can do it to a certain extent, but Roberta, do you want to? Okay. <laughs> you haven't been sworn. You're the one guy in the room. Eric, you want me to take notes while you do this? Yeah, he, yeah, please go to the podium. For, for those of you in the audience, Eric used to have this job for many years, so he is the expert. Eric Cotton, Planning and Development. Um, the first question, once, just in generally, generally, speak, generally speaking, once the variance is granted, assuming that was the, the, for any case, this case or any other case, it does run in perpetuity with the property. It's a, it's a land right, in a sense, with that property. Property gets sold, that, that variance remains with the property, not with the property owner. The way it is shown on the site plan right now um, as a carport, any changes to that property, if they wanted to come in and make it into a garage, they would have to come back before the board. If they wanted to make it into a room, they have to come back before the board. If they wanted a second story, they have to come back before the board. It is specifically to what's shown on that site plan, period. That's what they get, but that's what the board chooses to approve. I'm not sure what the other question was now. There, there was a question about uh, whether it was whether it could be screened. 
whether no, it's, it's, it's shown as a carport. It is to remain as a carport. The board can't put that condition on this variant or any other variant to clarify to make sure that it cannot be done in the future. They can, you know, if that was the intent of the board to approve it, you could put a, a condition on there, never to be in, never to be screened or enclosed. It's up to the board. The, then there was one more question, which, which was, was if this entire house was torn down, would this footprint, would the footprint that is there still? remain the footprint that is granted by the board for that site plan is what will remain on that property um is that correct Did i always thought if there was a material change like tearing this the entire structure down or if it burnt down would it still be able to go back the way it was yes they can burn they can okay. go back to but, the way it but was. as a carport only oh yes they get yeah. the same footprint but it's uh, tied to the site plan right okay yeah, they can't also add that as a second story on top of that. No, that's it's tied to this plan still. Okay. All right. Did we cover them all? I think I'll, okay. I'll go back over here. Well, <laughs> if, did we cover them all? If not, come up and. Okay. So the variance as it's being requested really just relates to this carport, Singles, right? And it has a, a single footprint. story carport with a footprint. With a footprint. But it conveys to the next property owner. Yep. And if the next property owner wants to tear down the building and put up a new home they they have a three-foot variance then on this no just as the site tonight's site plan just tonight is site plan. drawn okay they don't have three feet all the way down the side of the property they don't oh have so that. somebody builds a new house they can build it up to three feet just right there and only if it's a carport, carport. got it okay 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 does that help i think so okay any other just while you're up there <laughs> thank you and okay. go go nights my son's a knight okay any other questions for staff or the applicant okay seeing none uh, you have five minutes for rebuttal if it, if it makes everyone feel better the owner has advised me that if you would like to condition the approval with the specific statement that it cannot be enclosed, that's perfectly all right. Or screened? Or, no, not enclosed, not screened, not second story, <laughs> not playroomed. <laughs> okay. Just all right. Do you, you, have, you have five minutes. I mean, is well, there anything else I you want to say? I have nothing else to add. I, I, I hope okay. to approve it. Uh, okay. We want to continue to improve the property, and I thank you. All right. Without objection, I'll close the public hearing and open for the board for a motion and or discussion. So I think um, when we heard this last, there were some concerns. Those concerns, I think, have been addressed and answered. I think that the property owners have done a good job, and I think that the, uh, the applicant has done a good job of trying to work with the neighbors, work with what they have, um, and address concerns. And I think that given the fact that we have an existing structure um, that was uh, subsequently modified, but is being brought back to what was the existing structure, just improved to meet newer codes and address um, newer, new, newly sized vehicles, um, I think that this is appropriate. So I would be willing to make a motion if the chair would permit. Please do. All right, great. Where's the new language? Um, I move that the variance request for case VRB 19-92 <coughs> located at 2608 West Morrison Avenue be granted as uh, as depicted on the site plan uh, presented at the public hearing uh, for a, to reduce the west side yard setback from seven feet to three feet and the rear yard setback from three feet to zero feet and the eve to eve separation from five feet to one feet uh, for the uh, vesting of existing conditions on accessory structures um, with the condition that those structures as depicted on the site plan at tonight's public hearing um, as unenclosed never be screened or enclosed um, and that such, such, 
that said variance as condition be granted based upon the applicant presenting competent and substantial evidence in the record and at this public hearing of an unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty when considering the five hardship criteria set forth in section 27-80 of the city code specifically that they have existing conditions um, with the home that they are removing um, uh, added conditions um, that have been subsequently added vesting the original uh, roof structure and adding drainage a motion by Mr. Feldman. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Second by Ms. Hertek. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? You've been approved 5 to 0. All right. We'll call the next case uh, VRB 19 80. I do have a request from the audience that they can't hear us very well. Uh oh. So if I can have the sound booth kind of do a test to make sure all mics are coming in clear, including the mics on the podium. And please, if the audience can't hear us, raise your hand and let us know you can't hear us. And there are addendums up front if, if you came in late and did not get an addendum. Agenda, sorry. Okay, VRB 1980, located at 15 West Spanish Main. The code sections in question is uh, 27-284 and natural resources is here um, if you have any questions of them. The applicant is seeking to reduce the rear yard wetland setback from 25 feet to zero feet. The applicant is seeking to construct an open air cabana and pool deck extension in the rear of the property. The property is zoned RS-75. The house was purchased in 2010 and the existing family residence was constructed in 2012. It's an, an aerial view of the property. Again, the property in question is in red. The surrounding property is RS-75. The wetland area is back here. The survey is very light and hard to read, but this is the survey of the property. Existing structure, existing pool, and then the wetland setback is in red. Or the wetland, wetland boundary, sorry, wetland boundary. Proposed plan is as shown. The structure, new accessory structure is here. The wetland line is here with the required setback here. Looking to the front of the house. Looking east. Looking west, and I have no other information here. If you have any other questions, um, do you know if there was a variance given for the pool? Because it's obviously in the setback. It was with the. Uh, well, let her speak and then you can I, I'm not aware of that. We're just looking okay. at what's before right. us tonight. I, and natural resources here to add some Okay, and, and the applicant will probably bring us up to speed. I'd say the applicant will probably tell us. Okay. All right. Okay. Applicant? Oh, wait. You're going to come forward first, Mr. Yeah. Knox? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. So, Brian Knox, natural resources. Um, the proposed area for encroachment. Um, is limited by the separation of the new structure. And so uh, this is the cabana, as Roberta stated earlier. The site is in our RS-75 zoning district, uh, which, is, uh, which requires a 10-foot building separation. Um, we looked at what it would look like if they moved the structure a little further out of the wetland setback area. And it would cause some difficulties with um, 
the structure separation. They would need an additional waiver. So we felt like keeping it in the wetland setback area would be appropriate in this, in this occasion if they're willing to mitigate. And so natural resources work with the applicant to mitigate the encroachment with the following condition. As indicated on the plan, the 500 square foot of existing grass area to the northwest will remain as a green space buffer and will be planted with mangroves to provide additional runoff filtration. In addition, a roof runoff from the new structure will be directed to drain pipes to the discharge area to the front of the lot. Um, and have it. So here's the, um, the pool and deck area. There's the uh, edge of the property. Um, you see there's part of the deck right here. And here's the uh, EBC ribbon there. And let's see, there's more of the deck. And I think, um, natural resources available if there's questions. Okay, any other questions for staff? If not, okay, applicant, please come forward, state your name, address, and if you've been sworn. Sure, Mike Loomis, Landscape Fusion, uh, 3613 West Palmyra Ave, and uh, I have been sworn in. So they uh, pretty much sold it pretty well. Um, I can show some more of the existing backyard as it sits today. Um, as you clearly asked, uh, the pool was there. So when the house was originally built, um, from what I understand, was that the, the pool, the uh, deck you see, and the dock uh, that all fall within the wetland and wetland setback were all approved uh, for the original home. Uh, EPC did come out and delineate the line for us. We had to go through EPC, and we do have an approval letter from EPC saying they had no issues with what we were asking to build. Um, so that's one direction looking to the east, and then here is the secondary just beyond that looking to the east. Um, from there, they, Ryan showed a couple good pictures of the backyard, but um, as you can see, the existing deck is being is built over the riprap seawall. They do not have a seawall. EPC uh, doesn't allow the seawall there, so they have a riprap seawall. Um, so the line was delineated on the top of not the seawall, but the riprap. Um, the area here that we're looking at over on that side where those palms are, that grass, that is the area that we're saying we can put in a condition that we'll never be able to build anything in there that we've maxed out now, all limitations for the backyard. Um, the area here just beyond the railing, that riprap that Brian again showed, that would be the area that we're proposing to plant um, red mangroves to help just preserve and mitigate back to the uh, wetland area there. Their property line is not at the edge. Their property line is actually all the way out in the middle of the water, which um, is why the setback is so different. Let's see, this, this color copy here might help a little bit uh, for the situation. But um, as you can see, property line is, is uh, coming down here, but the exact property line is way out past the even existing dock right here. This area is the end of the canal, uh, if you want to call it that. Um, the only little bit of wetland is only uh, hitting this lot and the adjacent lot to the neighbor uh, to the east here. There's a little bit in there that was um, cleared uh, a couple years ago for the building of the new home. Um, you can see this would be the area, the 500 square feet that we would be mitigating to the approximate 500, 550 square feet that we're asking to build the cabana and the extension of the pool deck. Um, from there, we still have our uh, conditioned green space, so we're above our 25% in our green space, uh, saying we're impacting our 500 square feet and we're still within our previous impervious ratios for said property. And the blue line here indicates the edge of the, uh, the wetland, and then the wetland setback of 25 feet, which clearly has a swimming pool in it, a corner of the house, uh, and then the dock and the deck are all built in the wetland itself. 
Um, egress would be on the right-hand side. There are, the only tree that even comes into question is a pine tree off the front right-hand corner of the house, and we'd be taking uh, proper precautions for protecting that tree through the construction and access. And then, like uh, Brian had mentioned again, running all our roof gutter drainage out to the street to percolate back around the corner. Um, from there, if you guys want to see the finished product, I can show you that. So from the aerial down view, uh, as you can see, existing pool, but this is our structure over on the right-hand side. What we are proposing to build is just a little bit more usable space in their backyard, open up their back porch, <coughs> and then come down to where they can have a seating area, cabana. And looking back um, from overall standpoint, looking at it from the other direction just to give you guys an indication of height size um, aesthetics matching the house just trying to give it a little bit of outdoor living that concludes your presentation uh, yeah so you guys have questions okay uh, well we'll see if there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak on or against this application please come forward Okay, seeing none. Questions for the applicant and or staff? Mr. Phillip. I, uh, I, giving your depiction, I assume this to be the case, but uh, is the owner okay with a condition that the pool house has constructed never being closed? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? No, yeah, my time's up. <laughs> I don't see any other questions, so you have five minutes for rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to say. Okay. Nothing further. All right. And all, without objection, I'll move to close the public hearing. Uh, board would like to make a motion and a discussion. Quiet board tonight. It seems as if um, the applicant has um, worked hard to address concerns with natural resources. Um, given the 10 foot building separation that is required um, for, for this location and the zoning, um, and the extensive wetland setback um, because of the way this property is laid out, its property line ending in the middle of the waterway, it seems that this um, would, would meet variance criteria, including the hardships uh, and practical difficulties. So um, I'll like go ahead make and that a motion? try and make a motion okay. on that. Thank you. Gauging that everyone doesn't have any other comments on that. Um, I move that the variance request for case VRB 19-80, uh, located at uh, 15 West Spanish Main, be uh, at, at, uh, as depicted on the site plan presented at the public hearing, uh, to reduce the rear yard wetland setback from 25 feet to zero feet and reduce the building separation from 10 feet to five feet, um, be uh, be granted with the following conditions um, that the pool house as depicted on the site plan never be enclosed um, and that said variance as condition be granted based upon the applicant presenting competent and substantial evidence in the record and at this public hearing an, of an unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty when considering the five hardship criteria set forth in section 27-80 of the city code uh, specifically that um, they are trying to meet building separation and address this unusual, uh, unusually large wetlands setback um, uh, that is uh, that is in place because the property line runs to the middle of the waterway. Yeah, we're going to we're going to add the conditions for natural resources. Okay, and that. Um, is, is that on here somewhere? Where is that? On the site? 
Well, they had testified that uh, they would maintain the oh oh, and green that they space and plant the, the mangroves. And okay, and that they meet the mitigation as uh, required by uh, natural resources, including um, planting of mangroves and uh, maintaining the green space as established on the site. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Feldman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Villa. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Been approved. Five Thank to zero. Next case is VRB 1987. Can you hear me now? Move right along. Roberta Curry, Planning and Development. Uh, next case, VRB. 1987, address is 3414 West Barcelona Street. Code sections in question under consideration is 27156. The applicant is seeking to increase the height of the existing detached garage from 15 feet to 24 feet and to reduce the side yard setback from seven feet to four feet and also to reduce the rear yard setback from 20 feet to five feet. Applicant is seeking a variance to construct a new garage with laundry room and second level bedroom and bath. The property is zoned RS50 and was purchased in 2011. The existing single family residence was constructed in 1925. <coughs> Staff has found uh, it con inconsistent. <coughs> and Natural Resources is also here um, to go over some criteria. Again, property in question is outlined in red. The surrounding properties are RS50. There is RM16 to the east. Site plan. Main Street is here, access, driveway access coming in this way. And this is the structure here for the accessory structure, two-story accessory structure. Looking at property from the front. Looking to the east. Looking to the west, and this is the side of the property with the existing structure to the rear. I have no further information to add to the record, so I'm here for questions. Seeing none, Mr. Knox, please. Brian Knox, Natural Resources. Uh, Natural Resources went out to the property to take a look at the proposed structure in relation to the off-site trees. And so as you can see on the site plan, the trees are not shown. I can zoom in a little bit. So you can. So here's the garage structure right here. And there's an off-site tree located approximately right here that's not shown on this preliminary site plan. Um, we reached out to the applicant. Uh, we asked them uh, if they could show the tree and also if they can give us some additional heights in relation to what they're proposing to build. And uh, we didn't receive that, and so because of that, Natural Resources could not find this case consistent. Um, and for that reason, we feel that the, the actual tree that's off-site would be effectively removed if they were allowed to go to a height of 24 feet to build a two-story structure. Um, I, I think that's the gist of my comments, but natural resources is available if there's questions. Yeah, I've got some. Uh, can you give us a little more description of the off-site tree, the size, the species, the okay. approximate distance away from the proposed structure? Okay. So um, this is the general location of the tree um, at, in relation to the structure. Uh, the tree is roughly about um, 
12 to 14 inches in DBH. We couldn't get an accurate measurement on it because we, it was an off-site tree. Um, just a little more detail of the limb structure. This is a live oak. This is a part of the structure that would um, be impacted by the two-story development. So <clears throat> Natural Resources estimates that the removal of limbs would occur along here and reach all the way up to the Brian, upper portion of the canopy. Brian, can you zoom out? We're yeah, zoom out a just a little focused. bit, Brian. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> That's better. Okay. So basically, the, the portion of canopy that would be missing is from, from this limb into the upper portions. And so for us, looking at the other side of the canopy, it's already uh, been <coughs> impacted. So we're not left with much canopy at the end of the day once a two-story structure goes up. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Um, applicant, please come up, state your name, address, and if you've been sworn. My name is Brian DeCosmo, uh, owner of Tampa Building Solutions. Uh, I'm the agent for, oh, sorry, 4014 West Palmyra Avenue, Tampa, Florida. Um, I have been sworn in. Been sworn. Okay, go ahead. I am the agent for the uh, homeowners. They are here tonight in case there's any questions of the homeowner. Um, essentially, uh, the, as, as seen on the pictures already, the um, existing structure um, is non-conforming as it sits now. It is over the 750 square foot uh, allowance, if you will, for an RS-50 stru uh, ancillary structure in the back of the property. Um, it's been there for some time. It looks to date from the 50s, if not earlier. Um, so it has been a, an existing condition for a number of decades. Um, what they're proposing to do um, is to add a second story to the structure and um, I guess the, the biggest address issues that we were cons that, that um, Brian from Natural Resources addressed was the structure on the west side of the, uh, on the east side of the property. Um, the actual structure is, in general will be actually smaller in footprint on the actual existing lot than it is currently. It'll be three feet narrower. All the space coming off of the east side of the structure, which would remove it further away from the existing tree. The last seven feet on the east side of the structure would remain at the current height that it is so that we would be 11 feet um, to that point there um, before the structure would actually go vertical. And at that point there on the corner would only be 15 feet. So the 24 foot peak of the roof line would be well beyond the canopy of the tree. Um, and, and I have a few photos from the side view of that as well, um, looking at it. Um, and if you, so this point here, this is, it's kind of taking on the same shape, if you will. This structure here, this piece is what is existing today. We're going to mimic that on the new structure shown on, that, uh, on the elevation here. Um, this will actually all be shifted uh, three feet to the west, if you will, uh, before the incline comes up beyond the canopy of the tree. Um, so we, we, I went out and did field measurements myself and didn't it didn't appear that we would actually infringe at all on the canopy uh, of the tree from there. Um, we can re-verify that with natural resources in the field with, a, with a, an, act, an actual uh, height pole, but I did it out in the field myself with the laser measurement, and it seems like we'll be five to seven feet beyond the existing canopy, not impacting any substantial limbs or branches on the, on the tree, um, is, is what, we, what, it, what it appears on the field. Um, again, without actually doing an, an exact measurement with, from the top of the roof line, it would be impossible to know that exactly. Um, unfortunately, I, I didn't have a chance to get out there and do the actual top roof measurement on the middle, but the, the structure should be far enough west and the roof lines where they start to uh, elevate will be um, substantially further over than they are now. Um, and then with the... Um, and we and you know and, and part of the reason why this property is so unique as far as uh, the, the issues, if you will, um, trying to do another room on this property, the the existing structure 
which was, was noted was built in 1925, is uh, mainly intact as the structure was built in the 20s. It hasn't been added to. It's a two bedroom, two bath home. Um, with the driveway coming down the east side of the property, off site to the right, there's approximately a, almost a four foot in diameter live oak out there. So if they were to add to the primary structure, which they have enough space between the side of the building and the property line, if they had to reconstruct a garage further forward um, and then put a room above it coming forward, they would be severely impacting the, the, the large oak on the side of the property there, as well as the root structure that would be underneath that existing driveway now on that side of the house. Um, the, uh, and also if you built a structure like that on the side of that home, it would be very awkward and very um, glaring on the front side of that house because it would make the whole house seem lopsided off to the one side due to the size and the nature of the existing structure uh, from there. Um, Again, like I said, there's already currently an existing laundry room, bathroom, and the garage existing on the, on, the, on the ground at 760 approximate feet. So we're trying to lessen the impact on the trees by the right by you know, bringing the, the, the structure further off the east property line to give us a little bit more separation from the tree, and then also leaving the, the east side of the building as low as possible for that seven or eight feet coming in off the edge of the, pro off of the building to give us an 11 or 12 foot buffer, if you will, off the fence line um, from the tree. The tree is approximately a foot off the property line to the east. Could you raise that up a little bit? Oh, sorry, absolutely. So the trees, you know, went out and measured. It's right at the corner of that building. It's about 12 inches from the, from the fence line. And right now, currently, the building is about 15 inches from the fence line as well. So it is relatively close, as Brian noted from Natural Resources. It is, it is close to the tree. It is, it is, it's right now, it's very, very close. Um, as seen in the pictures um, that he supplied as well as myself. Um, so we were very aware and very cognizant of the, of the tree issue um, here. And that's the tree in question that sits there off the side of the building. And then if you look at the sight line, um, you know, the, the, the vertical structure wouldn't start here. It would actually start further back and beyond the, 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 the canopy line. And that was kind of our intention uh, when we did the design, such that we wouldn't try and build the entire structure like a box 24 feet up as a vertical structure overall. So we'd have some uh, clearance uh, and also some uh, ability to uh, stay away from the canopy so we wouldn't impact it. Um, beyond that, the um, other issues that are kind of unique to the structure, like I said, to the building, is that the um, lot also is substantially larger than a typical RS-50. The lot is actually a 75 foot wide lot um, as opposed to a 55 foot wide lot in an RS-50 zoning. Um, so these kinds of structures are not uncommon in Palmasia. And if the zoning has, you know, if, the, um, if this was on an RS-75 zone lot, this would be actually in compliance except for the height of the overall structure as far as square footage. So it gives us a little bit more leeway that we're not gonna overpower the property with the size of the structure also not gonna overpower um, the roadway with the structure, and it's also gonna be a little less impactful on the actual footprint on the ground, so we'll have a little bit more um, green space to the side, but next to the tree, trying to give us a little bit of separation so we don't impact the tree as much as possible. Um, they did explore their options of second story above the building itself, but it was deemed financially uh, impractical from a standpoint because the entire structure would have to be removed from the second story and re retrofitted for code to make it come up uh, up to code and then it would also make the building expand dramatically for inclusive of a staircase which would impede the ability to get back to the garage as it sits in the back of the structure I think that's all i have unless there's other questions uh, we'll check with we'll check with the audience first okay. before we ask you questions is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on or against this application please come forward state your name address and if you've been sworn You'll have three minutes. Certainly, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Brad Bell, um, 3612 West Sevilla Street, on the road a little bit, but actually the, the east neighbor, the one that has that tree, is my mother. And um, she's elderly, Parkinson's, and doesn't travel well, so she asked that I come speak in her stead. Um, the primary issue, obviously, that she has, and you could probably see from some of the photos, uh, that's right where the back porch area is for her, and that's where she has obviously her plants, and that's her space and where she hangs out. And, and the idea of going straight up 24 feet right next to her is really going to create a, a, a 
cave back there. Um, there's limited sunlight that's coming in anyway, and once you add a two-story structure right there, in essence, in her backyard, she's um, certainly concerned of the impact of that. I noticed that it also stated that it was, which I guess I don't understand, I thought it was going in from seven to four, but it sounded as though they're saying that it's actually get further away from the east side line. Um, it sounded initially that it was gonna be closer and going straight up, so obviously there was a lot of concern on behalf of my mother as far as you know, the impact on her property and you know, still getting sunlight um, back there. There is a large oak tree um, further up, yes, and then these, uh, these two oaks are, are back there at the end. So um, yes, we, we are definitely concerned with the impact that it would have on her enjoyment of her property next door, particularly with the going up. I, the lot line portion of it really, that didn't concern her as much as the, as the going up and blocking out. That's not me, I promise. Um, as the going up and blocking out the light. So that was our concern. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Okay, seeing none. Board, do you have any questions for the applicant or staff or resident or neighbors? I do. Mr. Feldman. Um, actually, I think this question is probably for uh, Mr. Knox first and then perhaps for the applicant second. Um, Mr. Knox, can you do you know how um, how the foundation for the new structure will differ from the foundation for the old structure, and how will that impact, if at all, the tree root system? Uh, because my thought is that a two-story structure is going to require a different foundation than what's currently there. Obviously, you're moving further away from the from the tree, and Presumably there's some sort of foundation there now, but how, how is that foundation system going to affect the tree under the uh, new or proposed uh, structure? Yeah, that's an that's a unknown at this time. Um, and usually what happens is under a building permit or under uh, possibly a tree consultation, uh, we would have the opportunity to look at the root system in a situation like this. Uh, given that uh, there is concrete and this tree is relatively young, it's likely that the tree roots have grown away from the concrete areas and maybe abutting the concrete edge. And so that is a possibility of something that is happening now on the site. How that would impact with the two-story structure, as long as the building doesn't encroach further into that abutted root system, it shouldn't be um, as impactful as it normally would. I can't, I can't say for certain if it's going to be a, a heavily impacted tree or not. Okay. And I guess the, then the follow-up would be for the applicant, um, do you know what your foundation is as it currently stands underneath this existing structure and how that foundation is gonna need to change um, if you build the new structure? Um, the plans have not been engineered at this point, so I can't say for certain uh, what the uh, foundation would be. Um, the way that structure is designed, that piece that's to the east side that's gonna be closest abutting the tree is only gonna be single story for that section. Um, in that case, and, and since the um, garage obviously is at grade level, the foundation or the slab, if you will, is at grade level, um, it would be typical of a building um, of that nature to have what they call a monolithic footer, which would be a 16 by 12 poured concrete foundation continuous on the outside edge. So it would be below grade by uh, about, uh, about nine inches, give or take, because you'd be about two or three inches above grade for the, for the reveal for the concrete um, as it sits today. Um, and just to, as, a, as a side note to the comment from the gentleman in the audience, the um, current building is one foot from the sides of yard of the property line. So instead of it being one foot as it sits today, it would end up being to an existing of four feet. The request to the board had to be according to code. So yeah, so the building actually is shifting to the west three feet from where it is currently, which would be four feet from the property line instead of one foot as it sits today. 
but and then um, I'm sorry. Was there another question about the foundation? No, I think um, you covered the foundation. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so it would be we would actually, um, you know, and, and again trying to alleviate the impact on the tree and the root system, which you know the homeowner, my homeowner, is sensitive sensitive to as well because they don't want to lose the tree either. They don't want to lose the trees either in the front or the rear of the property because they do like the aesthetics. And they are a South Tampa resident, and they are cognizant of the uh, uh, public support, if you will, for the tree canopy, as they are as well. Go ahead. I have a question. Yes, um, so you say you're moving. So you, are you basically taking the whole structure and moving it, or is it also being shortened on the west? Side? It, it, it basically, right now, the structure is 38 feet as it currently resides on the property. It would become 35 feet with just the east wall coming further into the property. Okay, so, so yes, the other line is going to stay exactly where it is. And the rear line would stay exactly the same as it is now, because currently the building's five feet off the rear property line as well. But just to clarify, you're tearing down the existing. Um, we're going to try and reuse what we can and maybe just re-pour the foundation along the edges we need to. It's, it, it, it's easier construction-wise to leave the foundation if we can in the slab that's there. Um, but we would have to do um, some reinforcement of the foundation along the edge of the building to support the new structure. Um, the foundation that's there currently on the building does not meet any kind of the current codes. That's been looked at that we know for certain. And the, well, I'm not going to design your building for you. No, that's fine. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Knox, I've got a question regarding the other 45-inch tree. If if the property owner wanted to construct something new on that side of the house, uh, whether it be one story or two story, um, did you look at that and try to determine if they had the amount of room they would need there compared to what they're trying to do on the existing accessory building? I, I briefly looked at it in relation to what was proposed to being built on the property, and I just it was a quick assessment and two stories just wouldn't work. At getting close to the getting 40. Getting closer to that 45 right. inch tree, it just, it would not work. So even if the canopy wasn't a problem, how close could they get to the trunk? Hmm. Without well, we, getting into hybrid right, foundation right. systems and all of that. Course. So typically it's a minimum 20 feet. Okay. Uh, we do allow um, 15 feet with pervious material for the driveway. Right. However, the foundation would, uh, we start at a minimum. We don't, we don't get that so much these days. So what we do is we ask to take a look at the root system. And based on that, if we find some roots, we'll ask them to push it further back to the, the minimum required setback. If, if there are no roots, we ask, we allow them to encroach. And usually um, that encroachment point is around somewhere 14, 15 feet. So. Okay. All right, that's all I had. Um, is the rear setback, uh, I guess, variance that you're requesting, the building's going to stay in the same, like it's going to be set back as much as it currently is? Correct. The, the, the building currently is five feet from the property line, so the setback for the rear would continue to be consistent with where the building sits today. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so you've you know, talked about this three feet that you're moving it over to the west. Um, was that in response to the Department of Natural Resources assessment, or is that just how it was designed initially? We, we designed that way originally um, okay. because we were the designer and architect who drew the prints and um, myself are aware of the tree issues. <laughs> and we were trying to keep the, the east side of the building as low as possible not to impact the canopy on that side of the building. And then also to give us a little bit of separation so the, the existing tree wouldn't, A, cause problems with the building, and vice versa, the building wouldn't cause issues with the tree. Uh, one last question, why, why 24 feet instead of something lower? Um, 20 it's, feet or, I mean, it's two stories. Correct. So how do you get to 24 feet? With the peak of the roof to allow the runoff to keep it from draining off the back of the building, which makes it very difficult to control the um, shed of water. Um, we tried to adjust the roof so that we, it would, we could capture on the, on the left and right side of the building and bring it forward to keep it from causing a runoff problem. Um, with uh, an eight or nine foot ceiling upstairs and an eight foot ceiling downstairs, and we add the floor trusses, um, you'll be at you know, 19 to 20 feet to the ceiling height of the building regardless without a roof system on top of it. Um, so the four feet gives us enough that we can put a pitch on the roof and shed it off. 
sure. of a flat roof structure would be not typical of what you would see in that neighborhood for that period of a, of a house to uh, keep the height that low. Um, you could potentially get it down to 21, 22 feet with almost a flat roof, um, but that would be a very odd configuration. And all of a sudden, the, the structure would become mat more massive on the top edge because the roof line would be straight across at the 20 feet as opposed to just having a small point where it reaches that high peak. That high peak. Okay. Uh, what, what do you do, uh, how do they mitigate the water now? Right now, it's just it just runs off. Right now, it's it's just it's rolling off the front and the back of the building, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's just the front piece obviously hits the concrete and rolls forward. But the old roof system that's there doesn't have a soft or a fascia piece that you can actually attach uh, gutters to it. It's an open, um, conventionally framed roof with just a uh, old metal roof screwed to the old two by four. So there's no fascia or any kind of substantial structure you could attach a gutter to. Mr. B, I think you mentioned this earlier, but just. Uh, uh, could you repeat the size of the, uh, of the of the residence as it now stands? I think you said it was two bedroom, is that right? The two bedroom, two bath home, yes, sir. About yes. 1,500 square feet. Okay, all right, great. Uh, looking at the photograph again, did you hear from any of the surrounding neighbors other than the one that we heard from tonight? That's the first person we've heard from, and that was the first we heard of it today. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, you have five minutes for rebuttal. I don't think I have anything else to add unless any other questions. Okay, well, then I will move to close the public hearing without objection, and board, what's your pleasure? Fine. Mr. Reed. Well, I would, uh, I would say this is like a case we heard earlier where someone is is uh, trying to protect the integrity of a historic home uh, by improving the, the property, adding to the size and so forth, you know, without altering the house. I mean, obviously there could be a second story put on the house, but then you've just blown the, the whole historic aspect of that property uh, to pieces. So I can understand why this would be a, a reasonable uh, request. So I'd be in favor of it. Um, I have a question for no we've closed the public hearing okay. well yeah for staff you can't okay, for yeah, staff yeah. okay I'm sorry um so what is like the procedure if the tree needs to come down but it's located on a neighbor's yard for our next natural resources so if it, if it is an off-site tree you would have to you would have to apply for a tree removal permit on a neighboring property you would have to ask the neighbor permission to remove that tree. And so that would, the, that would be the process for the removal of the tree in this situation. And with that yeah, comes mitigation. Uh, it's a 12 inch tree typically that falls into a um, three to four, uh, two and a half inch replacement category. Any other uh, comments from the board? Mr. B? Well, I can make a motion. Uh, I don't think we have any conditions this time. So. Uh, <laughs> There's no easement. <laughs> no easements. <clears throat> so I'd like to move that the variance request for VRB 1987 for a property located at 3414 West Barcelona Street, Tampa, presented at the public hearing. Uh, to seek relief from section 27156 uh, in order to increase the height of the existing accessory structure from 15 feet to 24 feet, uh, also to reduce the east side setback from 7 feet to 4 feet and reduce the rear, uh, rear yard setback from 20 feet to 5 feet <coughs> with an encroachment for eaves and gutters and that's based on the applicant pre uh, presenting competent and substantial evidence in the record and at this public hearing for an unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty when considering the five hardship cri uh, criteria set forth in section 27-80 of the Tampa City Code, specifically that uh, this is an RS-50 lot, it's a small lot. <coughs> uh, we do have some issues with uh, a neighboring tree and this is a tree at the side of the primary structure, which uh, 
does limit uh, the uh, certain area of space uh, on that side of the house, which I guess that's the east side. And so therefore the, the practical solution would be to uh, replace the garage. Uh, by doing so would also prevent the altering of the historic nature of the existing residence, which I note is a small, basic, relatively small two bedroom home. And uh, I think it's also keeping in uh, harmony with the neighborhood and the architecture. Okay, we have a motion for approval by Mr. V. Is there a second? Second. We have a second by uh, Ms. Walker. Uh, is there any board discussion? Um, I'd like to just make one comment that um, the applicant, in my opinion, did demonstrate some concern for the neighbor next door by the design that was proposed with the one story um, and pushing or bringing the proposed structure further away from the property line and the tree in the process. Uh, that was my biggest concern. Um, so I, I can, you know, <coughs> probably vote in favor of this. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? You've been approved five to zero. Next case is <coughs> VRB 1988. Okay, Roberta Mead, Planning, Design, and Development Coordination. Case number VRB 1988. The address is 3004 West Baycourt Avenue. Code sections <coughs> under consideration tonight is 27-290. The applicant is seeking to reduce the building separation from five feet to four feet two inches and the west side yard setback from three feet to zero inches zero feet sorry to vest existing arbor and or accessory structure the property is owned rs60 and was purchased in 2015 the existing single family residence was constructed in 1911 the site is currently under violation of uh, code enforcement case CMP 19003471 for the accessory structure, um, which is asking for the site setback. Property in question is circled in red. Surrounding properties are residential and the um, zoning is RS60. I've never seen it <coughs> addressed on the drawing. Um, it's catching me off guard. This is the property in question site plan. Bay Court is here. Bartlett Street is here. The accessory structure in question is here. Front of the property. Looking east at the corner. West. This is the accessory structure in question here. Close up to that. This is looking along the side street on Bartlett. Looking further down, and again, this is the west side of the property. Structure to the rear. And no further information to add to the record. Okay. 
Applicant, please come forward, state your name, address, and if you've been sworn in. Good evening, board. Uh, my name is Matt Newton. I'm an attorney at Shoemaker, Loop, and Kendrick, uh, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard here in Tampa, and I have been sworn in. I will try to be as efficient as possible. Um, this is a request to vest an existing gazebo accessory structure along the western side of this property. Um, just to orient everybody real quick, uh, we, as Steph had mentioned, we're on the corner of Bay Court and Bartlett Street. Uh, it's a corner lot. Uh, this is Euclid here along the north, McDill, Bay Shore. Um, you can see, of course, the over it naturally over there. Uh, this is a property that's zoned RS60. Um, this is the comprehensive plan here. You can see it's in the South Tampa Planning District. Um, uh, future land use R10, surrounded with some commercial mixed use to the west. Uh, this is part of one of the older subdivisions in the city of Tampa, uh, Bay City, which was platted in 1906. Uh, here you can see, again, the, the property located on the corner lot here at what was once named 2nd Avenue in Pine Street. As staff had mentioned, this is a, an old structure, originally constructed in 1911 according to the, uh, the property appraiser records. And uh, from what the owner has told me, the original frame was brought in from a, uh, by train and ordered in a Sears robot card catalog. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I thought it was interesting. Um, here again, the, a picture from the, the intersection looking onto the property. And as staff had pointed out, this is the accessory structure uh, peeping over the top of this fence. Uh, the property owner purchased this property, uh, the Longin family, in 2015. Um, here is a survey dated the day of acquisition, July 8th, 2015, depicting the accessory structure as existing on the property when it was originally acquired. Uh, there was recently code enforcement action initiated. Um, and so we looked at ways to, to handle this. Uh, as much as I love in appearing before the Variance Review Board, I view that variances should be a last case remedy. Um, so the first thing I wanted to look at was, when was this accessory structure built? Is there, uh, when you have a building that was constructed in 1911, could this be a, a legal non-conforming <coughs> grandfathered structure? Um, and we just couldn't figure it out. Um, this is an aerial from 1965. Here's the house here um, existing. It looks kind of like a, a Q-tip can't tell if there's an accessory structure on there. Um, and as you get sooner, um, these are from the, federal, the Florida Department of Transportation, by the way. Here's one from 1995. Of course, now the uh, canopy that we're so proud of in, in the city of Tampa, the tree canopy starts to obscure whether it exists or not. Uh, the most recent, uh, or I guess the oldest aerial I could find was from the property appraiser back in 2006, where you can see it pre-existing then. Um, so it looked like the only remedy we would have uh, would be to seek variances from this board uh, in order to retain the structure. There's specifically three variances that we're looking at. Uh, a zero foot side setback where three feet is required along the west. Uh, a 10 inch encroachment into the five foot uh, eastern setback between the principal and accessory structure. And then the, uh, the biggest variance that we're requesting is a 10 foot eight inch encroachment into the front yard setback because in an RS60 district, there is a 60 foot setback uh, to accessory structures. Um, as you can see, again, it is a corner lot, so you kind of have almost two front yards, although that's not treated that way for zoning purposes. And then, uh, of course, an existing two story frame garage in the rear. Uh, practically speaking, the offsite impacts for this variance are, are very small. Um, you see this uh, 35 inch oak here in the front yard, which really obscures the view of the accessory structure from the right of way. Um, of course, if you get in front of the neighbor's property, you can see it peeking over the, the top. Um, however, as you can see here, uh, we did get uh, letters of support from the neighbors, uh, most affected, in my opinion, here on the west. Uh, Luis Diaz of 3003 West Bay Court Avenue has submitted a statement of support uh, across the street here. 3002 West Bay Court Avenue, uh, the, uh, it's like Fussell family has submitted a, a statement of support. And uh, 
as my client pointed out, I made a mistake here. This is actually a vacant lot. This letter of support is from this property owner here, which is 3004 West of Bay Villa Avenue. Um, so that we did reach out and make sure there wasn't opposition from the folks that are most affected. Um, and he will, as you'll see, applicant here has two properties. Uh, they own the property in the rear as well, where the, uh, the family's mother lives. Um, in conclusion, this is an applicant acquired in 1911, <coughs> built home with the condition on site when acquired. Uh, the date the condition was created is unknown, leaving us with the only remedy of variance. Um, the conditions naturally screen, and the folks uh, most directly impacted by the off-site impacts, which would be more visual in nature, um, have voiced their support. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, that's all I got. Sure. Again, Roberta Curry, Planning and Development. I need to correct the record. I believe the address I stated on the record was 3004 West Baycourt Avenue. The address is actually 3001 West Baycourt Avenue. Also, the variance request was amended, um, and they did re-notice for their uh, change. So the variance request still is affecting and in under consideration for Code Section 27-290. The request is to reduce the west side setback from three feet to zero to reduce the eave to eave separation from five feet to four feet two and to allow the front yard setback for the accessory structure to be reduced from 60 feet to 49 feet five inches okay. any questions that's what our agenda says. Yes, that's what the agenda said, but that's not what I read on the, from the oh, report, I'm so sorry. I apologize. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you for that. All right. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on or against this application? All right. Seeing none, uh, board, do you have any questions for the applicant and or staff? Uh, I'll go ahead. Um, was this recently redone? It just looks a lot newer than yeah, 2006. Yeah, so, so code enforcement uh, began once they started doing termite repairs, okay. um, which I think thank caused you. some attention, and that's what started this. Okay, thank you. What, I, I, they were doing what kind of repairs? Some termite repairs, gutting it out. So it was, it was being substantially, and I mean, this is, it's already existing here. It was being substantially repaired for termite damage. Uh, can and you give us a little more info of what substantially repaired means? Uh, get to, <laughs> in, in the photograph, it looks brand new. Yeah. So it was, it was, I think, it was essentially torn down then rebuilt into the footprint of what was on the, the so survey back in 2015. The, so is the code that, infraction, there was no permit pulled? No, the code infraction was the setbacks, not the, not the permit issue. But sure there, there will be. was there a permit pulled when it was re redone? I believe. We'll Let me ask my client real quick. Okay. Oh, if yeah. you haven't been sworn, you you'll. Been sworn. Been sworn. If you came in late, you'll have to be sworn yeah, in. I'll have to be sworn in. All right. Because I was not. Eric, please. I've actually met Eric. I went down and spoke to him <laughs> when this first happened. Anybody else speaking yeah. Not Anybody else who's come in late that might speak, please stand up now. It won't hurt, I promise. <laughs> okay. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you did this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and the made up the truth? I do. Okay. Was there a permit pulled? There was not a permit pulled at the time. The, the original deck, the way it was laid out, was attached to both the garage and the house. The, the deck itself was attached. When we purchased the property, um, it was infested with termites. And to be able to tent the house and the garage, get rid of the termites, we had to take the deck off of the house and whatnot. I hired a contractor to come out and take the original deck and pergola and build it back exactly the same direction that it was. Um, unbeknownst to me, but fully my responsibility, there was not a permit pulled by that contractor when he did it. Thusly, I believe somebody called in to ask 
whether or not it had been, and that's when it was red tagged and we stopped and haven't touched it since and going through this process. Okay, all right, that makes perfect sense. Um, the use of the pergola is for? Just outdoor living. I mean, quite frankly, when we purchased the house, that was my favorite part of the house, was the outside side area with the pergola and the deck and whatnot. And I didn't want to have to tear it up, but obviously there's only one way to do that. And when we built it back, we built it back in a manner that if we have to tent again, we can pull part of the deck on both sides to drop it all the way to the ground to be able to do it. Okay. Um, I'll leave you and the foundation to the building department. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you answered my question about the wood deck. Um, and and it's, a, it's a post and beam wood structure, right? Um, I believe so. It's Underneath, all, you talk about the structure of the deck or the pergola? The pergola. Yes. It's all wood. It, correct. It is all wood. It's four four columns and, and a roof system. Correct. Okay. Um, that's all my questions. Anybody else? <laughs> all right. No more questions. You have five minutes for rebuttal. Uh, no rebuttal. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Without objection, I'll close the public hearing. Board, what's your pleasure? Motion and or discussion. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I'll do a motion. I'll have the paper. Okay. But uh, uh, I, I would just paper. say, you know, could we, if we we could add the condition of it never being screened or. Well, we didn't ask if they would be okay true. with that. We'll yeah. have to open the public hearing again. That is the one thing I just thought of. Um, well, let me ask council this. We had this, con this same conversation with a previous assistant city attorney. Um, when a site plan clearly shows and testament clearly shows that it's not enclosed. Um, it's, it's being approved as an open structure, but uh, without the condition, that could change, correct? Without them coming back to the board. Well, I don't know that the site plan shows that it's not enclosed. You know, you see a horizontal view mm -hmm. of the layout of the structure, but it doesn't go into detail, and I don't see any other documents that you know, you see what's peeking out over the fence, but you really don't see the details. So where um, this board is, is considering including conditions of approval, if that's the direction that you're going in, um, best practice is to ask the applicant, the owner, right. if they agree with those conditions so that doesn't become an issue later. Right. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to open the public hearing? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? All right. Go for it. Uh, how would the applicant feel about never enclosing the new pergola? Uh, Matt Newton for the applicant. Uh, we would be happy to condition the uh, application on that. Okay, thank you. That would be in, in closing or screening. Uh, we are we consent to an enclosure or screening uh, condition on this. Okay. All right. I'll move to close the public hearing. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I move that the variance request for case VRB. <coughs> 1988 for property located at 3001 West Bay Court Avenue be granted as depicted on the site plan presented at the public hearing for a uh, reduction in side yard setback from three feet to zero feet, the front yard setback from 60 feet to 49 feet five inches for an arbor accessory structure and reduce the eave to eave separation from five feet to four feet two inches for an accessory structure. Um, uh, with the addition or with the condition that it never be screened or enclosed in any way, based upon the applicant presenting competent and substantial evidence in the record and at this public hearing of an unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty when considering the five hardship criteria set forth in section 2780 of the city code, specifically that um, there is not much backyard space and that there's a side yard and a front yard that makes it and an accessory existing accessory structure that basically leaves that as their only backyard space. Okay. Is, is that good enough? Is there is there any is there a second to the motion for approval by Ms. Hurtang? 
I, I would second with, um, if it please Ms. Hertek, with just a minor um, addendum that we have a 1911 uh, built home purchased in 2015 that um, the accessory structure was already present since at least 2006 and that um, the though it was removed and rebuilt in the exact conditions that those existing uh, structures uh, lend toward the practical difficulties or yes that's so a do, great do, addition do you accept his, yes his that's addition? perfect okay all right, so we have a motion for approval by Ms. Hertag and a, uh, a second by Mr. Feldman. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? You've been approved uh, five to zero. All right, next case, um, we'll do one more and then we'll take a break. Uh, VRB 19-94. Roberta Mead Curry, Planning, Design, and Development Coordination. VRB case number 19-94. The address is 10501 North 21st Street. The code section in question is in under consideration is 27-156. The applicant is seeking to reduce the side yard setback from seven feet to one feet to maintain and keep a side yard covered and screened patio. The property is zoned RS-60. The house was purchased in 1998. The existing single family residence was constructed in 1959. <coughs> aerial, aerial of the property in question, again is in area, is shown in red, which is the existing site, 21st Street here. The surrounding properties are RS-60. I'll turn it this way. <laughs> Survey of the property again, 21st Street is here. Driveway coming in. The existing accessory structure or existing um, structure to ask for the reduced setback is here. This is the subject property looking from the front. Again, the existing structure is shown here. Looking south. <coughs> Close up of the existing structure. Looking east. <laughs> Only if you're cross side. <laughs> Sorry. Bad camera day. I don't have anything uh, to add to the record, and the applicant is here. Okay. Any questions? No questions. Applicant, please come forward, state your name, address, and if you've been sworn in. My name is uh, uh, Caridad Oliveros, and my address is 10501. Uh, North 21st Street. And have you been sworn in? Yes, I've been sworn in. Okay. Do you All right. Spanish Are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay? Right. okay. We have your Yeah, I guess I'm okay. Um, I had a, a, a small patio done, and I, I, that's what I want to do is a screen patio. And uh, I didn't know, uh, the, I've never been to a variance or. Uh, well, we're here to help you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, 
acesso. Aqui é que não precisa de olhar tudo, para não. Não vou dar assim. Não quero que eu vá. Eu posso. Eu posso instructor. Você trouxe o seu papel com você, o seu papel, hoje? Sim. Asking for. So you need to ask the board uh, for that. Yeah, to keep the existing cover patio uh, reduced yard set back from seven to one foot. Okay. And why do you need that? Why do you? Need uh, that? Uh, because I want to make a patio, uh, uh, a screen porch. How long is the? Um, patio structure been there? Mm, I'd say about three, three, four years. Um, Attorney, you want to help us out? Well, I'm wondering if the applicant would prefer to have this item continued. I apologize that she's been here this evening. If there is a request for it, for an yeah. interpreter that was not received by my office, so we did not um, require one for this evening, um, but it's Should just a little her odd if she to wants have, to, yeah, it's want a to ask her if she wants to come back? Prompting questions of right. an applicant, so. Right. Can somebody explain that to her? Go ahead if you'd like to make a comment. Right. Sure. Ma'am, mm -hmm. so we can, Try and proceed if you'd like. We can work through and try and work through uh, to identify your hardships this evening. Or if you want, we can push this back to the next available hearing, which would be, I think, next month. Yeah, I think we have an opening. Okay. Um, and you, we would have an interpreter there who might be able to assist you um, and, and who speak Spanish and might be able to assist in translating some of the issues. Would you prefer to do that or would you prefer to try and proceed today? Do you wanna do you wanna wait till next month and have an uh, interpreter or do you wanna try and work through it tonight? Uh I think I just uh, get done with it today. Okay. Well if that's the case, then you need to explain to us um, if you have any pictures of no, the screen enclosure. No. Okay. Um, you need to explain to us why you need to build this, why it needed to be built, if it was permitted, um, those kinds of things, so that we can understand what your hardship is and whether we can consider to approve or disapprove. Uh, I guess I'll wait until next month. You'd like to wait? Yeah. Okay. All right, well then. All right, well, we please. just need to make I a motion would. to have it continue. Okay. Well, well before you do, ask oh. if there's anyone in the public well, that would be opposed to the request right. for continuance. Okay. Is there anyone here tonight that was, uh, that wanted to speak on this application, either for or against? We have a couple, we have three people, four okay. people. Well, did you want to take comments from those folks? Uh, can we take comments or should we not? If she's requesting As a continuance, the, continuance. the only no, no. question then for the public is what their position would be on, on the request for continuance as opposed to the merits of the application. Right. Okay. All right. So if, if you'd like to come forward, you're really all, we're only asking you to comment about continuing this if you're okay with that or not. We're not wanting to hear comments about whether you're for it or against it and why. Just if you are okay or not okay with having this continued to next month. So come on up, state your name and address and if you've been sworn and how you feel about having this delayed for a month. My name's Catherine Jones. I live at 10409 North 21st Street and I have been sworn. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I say no continuance because Mrs. Uh, Aravo, I can't pronounce, I'm sorry. Uh, she's a real estate lady. She speaks English when anyone's around, not around that she, I mean, I, I grant the gentleman doesn't always speak English, but she does. And I don't think this should be continuance because I have plans in December Okay. I don't want All right. You've, you've made yes. your point, I think. Uh, okay. Next person. <clears throat> Name, address, if you've been sworn. Bobby Jones, 10407 North 21st Street. And yes, I've been sworn in. Um, it's hard for me to make arrangements to be in town for this, too, because I work out of state. And it's hit or miss. I can't guarantee you when I'll be back in state. But... Um, you know, being that I agree this person does speak English. She has spoke to me multiple times in the streets, in passing, has talked to me many, many times, English. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Next person. Sorry about sounding like a broken record. Name, address, and if you've been sworn. Doris Jones, 10409 North 21st Street. Yes, I have been sworn. Thank you. I don't agree with them continuing it. They're, she understands English when it has to be understood, and she's just wanting to drag this out. Okay, thank you. Okay, board, based on those comments, what's your pleasure? Here tonight? No comments? I'm inclined to say that we should go ahead and hear it tonight. Um, I mean, it was properly noticed, although I will say um, I'm not sure how it affects the fact that an interpreter wasn't quite as requested, but um, one did not appear. That seems, you know, to be a something that was not created by the applicant. Mm -hmm. It was there a request? Was it definitely requested? I did not receive a request for an interpreter. Okay. So okay. the so requests are usually filed with the legal department, but um, that was not conveyed to me. Uh, I mean, Roberta, do you, do you want to add to that or, or not, uh, whether or not there was an actual request? Was yeah. it in writing? Is it required to be in writing? There was an email request sent at the time the draft agenda was sent to the attorney that she sits here in the area. So there was an email request. <laughs> a lot of staff. Uh, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of staff chase. Yeah. Um, then I do have another question. Uh, is is there, could we ask if anyone else in the audience is a speaker that would help translate, or is that just not kosher? Or? Yeah, legal, is that allowed? Thankfully, this doesn't happen very often. <laughs> um, if, if there was a member of the audience that felt comfortable interpreting, and if the applicant was willing to do that, given that we've got members of the public here that want to speak to it, I, I, you know, would I prefer that we have a certified interpreter? Absolutely. Um, but if the applicant on the record would be agreeable to that, then I, I guess we should consider it. Is first of all, I guess, to see if there's anyone in the public that would be willing to assist. Is there anyone here that could do that? Uh, I see no one. <laughs> uh, no one's volunteering. My Spanish is very rudimentary. Uh, so well, you can't. <laughs> I know, but I mean, I can't even ask questions. Right. I um, wouldn't be comfortable with no, my. And nor would I. Uh, I'm, I'm inclined to postpone this because there was a written or written request um, and I'm sorry about the people that have shown up tonight but um, if the applicant did make the correct request it's not her fault <laughs> that our staff didn't pick it up and it's worth noting for anyone who wants to make comments that written comments um, become part of the record and can be placed in the record part of the 
um, application process. So if anyone wants to, sub rather than appear next month, um, submit written responses, written comments, um, we would certainly take those into consideration um, when considering this application. Right, that's oh. correct. I have another question. Sure. It's, can we like, I don't know, request that an application be put further up on the agenda? Um, or maybe... Um, well, the in? issue is whether or not the, the other neighbors are even available. Um, I, I would certainly ask us to put it on next month, uh, but um, I don't know that it matters where on the agenda it happens. Well, that, sitting here for two and a half hours is... Yeah. That, that, that's well, yeah, we could certainly move it up. That's, cases usually yeah, they do uh, tend to follow, oh, yeah. follow up front. Right. Oh, that's true, because the continued cases right. work first. Uh, but my other question might be then to kind of mitigate, it would January be better for people who, I mean, December is a difficult month, so... Uh, well, I, I would I would think that the applicant is the one is okay. the sole decision maker on that. Okay. Uh, she, she didn't do anything wrong if she asked for the interpreter. So, um, so do we have a motion to uh, postpone this until next month? Yes. You want to make a motion? I will make a motion to postpone until the Jan or, um, December. December 10th. Is it December 10th? December 10th meeting. The December 10th meeting. All right, is there a second for that? Oh, I'm sorry, BRB 1994. Excuse me, yes. BRB 1994, moving it to the December 10th board meeting. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Vier. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, you've been moved to next month. And okay. we need to make sure we get that. And we'll be sure that there's someone here who can speak Spanish. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're going to take a five-minute break, if that's okay, with staff. I'm sure it is.